Thanks to everyone for being here for this talk about river blindness disease and how technology is helping to end this age-old scourge that affects 37 million people in Africa. I'd like to introduce Dr. Moses Kwatabara, a senior epidemiologist for the Carter Center, who is leading the fight against river blindness uh, and who has spent the last 20 years of his life uh, fixated on the tiny black fly that carries a parasite that causes uh, river blindness. Moses Katabara is a native U Ugandan, a medical anthropologist and a renowned public health expert providing scientific support for the fight against such diseases as river blindness, lymphatic filariasis, which is also known as elephantitis, and schistosomiasis. He worked with Oxfam, um, World Vision International, and River Blindness Foundation, and has been a speaker on behalf of the CDC, um, and currently also is an adjunct professor at Emory University. He has a master's degree and doctorate in anthropology from the Commonwealth Open University in the UK, received his master's in public health degree from Rowland School of Public Health at Emory University, and was awarded Emory University's Sheath Distinguished International Alumni Award. Please help me welcome Dr. Moses Katabara. Uh, good morning, and thank you for inviting us uh, with my colleague, uh, Ahana. And, um, we are about um, the topic on ending or end the age old scourge. And um, river blindness is not a disease uh, of, a, of places that you look at and sanitation is bad and everything looks bad. No, it's places that are pristine. It is found in a pristine environment. That's why I'm emphasizing the, the photograph on the screen. Uh, of course, Daniel Wright was, uh, has done a lot for us, and uh, he's a member of the Global Uncle Busters, and you're welcome to join. And once you join, you are a lifetime member. Um, this is the distribution of uh, river blindness or onchocerciasis, um, and this is where the Carter Center involved in combating this disease. In fact, in the Western Hemisphere, we are left with a small place, actually not a small place, but few people in the Amazon, uh, norm, uh, largely the Yonamami between Venezuela and Brazil. This is how the disease presents. This is a young man, 13 years old, and you can see on this side of the, yeah. of the leg, this is where they are, the worms are in the leg and he's scratching on that side. When the worms die, they cause an immune reaction. And it, he has more of these worms on this side of the body, and so he's scratching and creating sec uh, secondary infections that are causing this. And this is a nodule where the female and the male worm live. The female produces thousands of baby worms. This is a nematode worm. This is called uh, leopard skin. If you go and find someone who was not burnt in fire or something like that, and he has this kind of um, white skin, which we call leopard skin, that's onchocerciasis. And, and this is this called, we call this hanging groins, but you can see how the skin looks very rough. We even call it elephant skin. And river brightness can cause these terrible hydrosis. Uh, lymphatic paralysis does it, but also uh, this disease causes it. And of course, uh, you become blind. And we, a, a patient with river blindness, when they are getting blind, they see as if they're in a tunnel. They have what we call tunnel vision. And this is the only disease that, that causes this tunnel vision before, of course, you get blind. And it has also complications. Um, there is a complication called Nakalanga syndrome. This is dwarfism. And uh, this guy is 28 years old, and this, also guy, this guy is 28 years old. And the difference between this is that this one has never grown. He's a child. He has never developed secondary sexual characteristics. So he'll never marry. He'll never have a kid. He's actually a child with no pubic hair, nothing like that. And then this disease can also uh, cause epilepsy. And the extreme uh, seizures recently mentioned uh, called nodding disease. If you Google 
nodding disease, you will see how terrible it can be. We don't know whether it's associated with this disease, but some people already believe that it is associated with river blindness. And this is 99, over 99 of the cases are in, in Africa. And this is a former Onkosakas control program that was initiated in 1974 and closed 20, uh, 2002. And this is the African program for the Onkosakas control uh, that was initiated in 97 and is expected to close in 2025. And these are the countries that Qatar Center has, uh, is assisting and they have launched, instead of controlling the disease, they are out to eliminate the disease where it can be found in these countries. Uganda is at the forefront of Onkosakas elimination or river blindness elimination with 3.5 million at risk. Sudan about this, that is Sudan North. Uh, Ethiopia, at least 31 million people at risk. We know that the mapping is not complete as I, showed, as I will show you. Nigeria, 37.4. The Americas, of course, we are almost uh, finishing the job there. But I'll, I'll, I'll be showing you where we need Google. Um, we use a tablet called Ivermectin, uh, provided by Mac uh, company. It's donated free as long as it is required and as much as uh, needed. And uh, so you, when you give it once a year, a one dose a year, per person, you are controlling the disease, you are not stopping transmission. But when you give it twice, you are after transmission. You want to control transmission and the, and the worms in someone's body. But if you add on vector control or vector elimination with a biodegradable agent called Thermophos, you finish the job faster. Twice a year with a tablet, you take six to seven years. But with, uh, with the vector control, you probably bring it down to three years or two years in uh, control transmission. And then you can continue treating uh, for the next maybe two years and then you are done with, with uh, we are done. And this is, this is how these worms look like in the body, in someone's body. And the female worm is very long and, uh, and lives for 10 to 12 years. Now, if you have all these people and you take them to health facilities, medical facilities, the medical facilities will get clogged and will shut down. So the, the, what we do is treat people, train people and treat them within their community. So they learn how to do it. Um, they, they determine the dosage, they record, uh, we provide the medicine, they treat and take the records back to the health units, and through the health units, we get reports and, and order for more tablets. And, um, and so this is a, a teacher training people in the community under a mango tree. That's where it should be. And that's where they should be treated from. And we don't even use scales like in the hospital to determine dosage. We use a stick as a surrogate for weight, height as a surrogate for weight. And doing research, we realized that we could actually relate weight by height. And so using any stick calibrated will do. And we don't have to pay for that. Again, when you come to these low community the neighborhoods, you discover the women get involved and become very active. And so this is the stick at no cost. It was got from the bush. We helped. The, the, the supervisor helped to calibrate it. He's also a village person. And they are treating their own community. This is river gauging to determine the amount of chemical you can put in the river to clean the larval stages of the black fly. I'll be showing you the black fly is a vector for this nematode. And this is how they are using it. We don't need planes. Like in the 70s, they used planes in West Africa to those rivers with this habit. But now we use knapsack sprayers, train the villagers, and they do it. Show them how to do it. This is how beautiful an environment with Onkosakas River Blindness looks like. You are all invited to come and visit. And especially where we have no, where there's no transmission. It's 
beautiful country. And this is called Samurium dumnosum, a dumb nuisance. It bites like a, a bulldog. Um, and uh, and as, it, as it tears your body, it, uh, the, the nematode worm gets into, inside your body. And, uh, and this is how it looks like, the, 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 the larval stages on the on the debris and what in the rivers, and you can even see the flies flying off. It needs a crab uh, in its life cycle to complete the life cycle. Uh, I'm showing you these flies because they, trans they are vectors for the, for the disease. And this is how you trap crab. This is a crab trap, uh, trap trapping uh, device, locally made by communities. Actually, you trap mud fish <laughs> with this. And now they have adapted trapping crabs. And now you use them to, uh, to monitor whether transmission has been interrupted. If they are clean, then we know there is no flies being breeding. This is Uganda under control from 1992 to 1997. And Ugandans failed to know we must do something else. We cannot continue treating endlessly. And in 2007, they launched elimination as a policy for the country and see where we are. All these places are clean. Now, I zeroed here because uh, the gentleman here in Google gave me a, a Google image because we can't go across to DRC. There is DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and I couldn't prove that there was, Congo was free because you need a forest for the the, the nice fly, the gold-plated fly, um, you need a forest. Uh, uh, it's, that's where it, it survives. It's a shy, it loves cold environment. This is what we have done, cartocent-assisted uh, program in the, in the Americas, and our issue here is here. This is the problem. But all these are green areas, you can see. So we are left with very little in, but very challenging in the Western Hemisphere. And um, this is Ethiopia. All this area is unmapped. Its communication is difficult, uh, but this area is mapped. So work is going in the blue and yellow areas, and we have started distributing twice biannually, the medicine. Here it's still control. And uh, this area needs some refinement, mapping. No work is going on. And so there's a lot of work to do. And if we complete mapping, we will probably have at least 60 million people at risk in Ethiopia. Already where we are, they are about 30, 31 million. So the challenges. We still have vast and mapped areas, especially where countries have a countrywide elimination policy. And WHO will not verify uh, river blindness elimination for just a small place. They need to, to, to verify for the entire country. And then we have cross-border transmission issues. And for some countries, mapping agencies have not updated their maps. And we need this type of maps. Um, and sometimes they are not available. Where, where are the communities? <laughs> sometimes it's a jungle, like the Amazon. Where are the communities that are affected? Mapping on Kosakas is warranted when an area is inhabited. Because it's a human disease, we need to find, if there are humans, that's when we go to the mapping. But if you don't have the technology, you will go and find nobody and you have been wasting resources. But if you had technology and you know, you can tell that there are communities, then you can go where you, when you already know that there are communities. <coughs> um, technical challenges. Clean image acquisition, rivers, roads, forests, homes, fields. We want to be able to, because it's associated with fast running water. So we, uh, you need to see those white water, you need to see uh, because white water means well oxygenated water. That's where the fly is um, um, likes because of enough oxygen for its eggs. Cloud cover penetration. Um, I will show you some of the, the Amazon is an example. How do you, 
penetrate the clouds, um, distinguishing communities from other cleared areas of the forest, distinguishing active from abandoned Yonamami communities in the Amazon. Are there features, smoke, for example, characteristic of an active community? Can we tell? Penetration of the forest canopy to ex extract signals from the heavily forested streams. In the case of some um, uh, flies like uh, Simonium nevi, the, the gold-plated, which likes forest environment, how to get signals from lower resolution, more cost-effective um, images. What about cloud cover? Can we develop algorithms to extract useful data from images with significant cloud cover? Can we quantify the predictions? Can we develop ways to predict the sites that will be the most productive breeding sites? Extension of this approach, if we succeed, it can be used by in many diseases, especially vector borne diseases. Uh, here we call them NTDs or neglected tropical diseases. So the potential for this technology, if we can get it, would is is the use is 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 is, uh, is limitless. Um, here in USA, can we develop signals for cryosops spray deer fly? <laughs> breeding sites such as soil uh, moisture and high organic content. And all these are uh, places that the, fly, the, the deer fly will, will, will thrive. This is a kind of Yonamami um, village, I don't know if I call it, in, in the Amazon. Um, can we identify these? Then, does Google have this? Um, this is very interesting. The satellites collect several bands of information in each pixel examined based on the relative re reflectance observed in each pixel among the different bands. Uh, spectral signatures can be identified that are diagnostic for particular landscape features. And I will leave this information this, uh, for you to, to go it in details. And this is what the pixel reflectance looks like for the breeding site of Samurium or the black fly, where we see this pattern reflectance. We predict that the suitable breeding site um, is a, the habitat for the, uh, exists for the fly. And this is Daminosum, the black. They are all called black flies, but one is black, another is gold-plated. <laughs> so the black one. This is the, the satellite, what we did here. We had applied this to identify some EMD, you know, some breeding sites where the landscape characteristic is fast flowing water over Precambrian rock substrate. So the upper panel shows an area in a satellite image of such a habitat. The lower panel um, is a ground photograph of the breeding site. And then when we went to this for ground truthing, we realized that the Precambrian rocks seem to be the best habitat for the breeding of, of Samurium dimnosum, the black, the, the fly which is black. Um, and a, a paper will be, if you're interested, um, it's already published, you can look at it. There, there are great uses for all this stuff and uh, uh, two things I want to show here. This is my, this, this forest is about 40 kilometers from my home, where I was born. Um, it's a beautiful place, and they call it Imaramagambo, means leaving you speechless. Um, so that is a Nonko or river brightness uh, area. Do you see this? This is a, an, a called wind impenetrable forest, a tropical forest. And this is the border, this is Uganda, and this is DRC. How do I prove that this forest, because you need a forest for the fly that transmits this disease in this area, and I wanted to show them that in DRC, the forest has been decimated, so this eco ecology is gone. So how do we verify this as transmission interrupted of this disease? And uh, thank God there was Google around and there was my friends here, and we're able to prove, and the color 
this area now has moved from transmission active to suspected interrupted transmission. Now, if you are talking about disease verification, that's a big deal. <laughs> that's a big deal. It means that now you are free to go to this place for tourism. This is, a mount, this is where you find your mountain gorillas. So you can promote tourism here now. So uh, let's go to the, to the next uh, Google map. So we can, uh, using these images, we can actually be able to see what is happening across the border where we are not allowed to go. This is Venezuela and this is Brazil. This is the Amazon. So those, uh, the, the challenges I have already mentioned above uh, apply to this place. How can we make, how can we identify communities that have never been identified? But when you go to the Yonamami, they tell you, oh, this is not the only village. There are more villages. But you know, for them, a day, can you quantify a, day, a day's walk <laughs> in terms of miles? We can't. Um, to get in here, they're using helicopters from the, the Venezuelan army. Um, and and they, they go whenever they have a reason to go. They don't go because you want to go and check on this Yonamami. So having good images, we can identify these places. We can go in and train the Yonamami, provide the medicines and everything they need, and treat them and clear the Western Hemisphere of this scourge. You can see for Ethiopia, on this side of the country, we have done pretty well in mapping the area. But when it comes to this area, which is like half of, of the country, we have challenges. Um, and uh, communication, if we are to go here, you need to know where is the road. Because in some places, we did mapping, like in the case of Uganda, it was done on foot. <laughs> The roads were impossible. Uganda had just come out of war. Everything had been destroyed and neglected. And to map this disease, 70% was done on foot, like the explorers in the 15th century. <laughs> uh, uh, but things have changed. This were in the 21st century. Should we be doing that? You just go spend a whole week looking for communities, and you can't find them? Yet when we use these Google Maps, we can actually see where the commu active communities, where they are. We can see their fields, where they are growing some food. We can tell their communities. And we can also be able to see rivers. Uh, you can even enlarge and, uh, in, this, in this area. You will see some rivers. The, the image is not so good now. But you can see the potential, potentially that this is a highland. You can see the gorges, the valleys, and you can see there is a, they, they are likely to be fast running rivers. And then if we can connect with the communities, we can figure out how do we get there. And, and you can plan ahead what you need to do. Do you need to get porters to carry your tents and whatnot to go in and check on these communities and see whether they have the disease or not? And then provide, train, provide them with medicines. So all that stuff. Uh, without Google Maps, I don't know how we can do it. I mean, we can do it, but take, it takes years and years. So, so those are the challenges we have. This, we have WHO has now um, agreed that this disease can be eliminated. We have the technology, we have the, the medicines. The technology for mapping, I'm sure, is, is available. Um, we have the army. The army are the communities, the affected communities themselves. The army against this disease. So we, ha we have the, the, the political will from these countries. So uh, I think what we need is to get um, people who are interested in this kind of technologies um, to help us put our heads together and get rid of this age-old scourge. Thank you very much. Are there any side effects to the pills? And could you give them to people as a preventive measure, um, even if they don't show any signs of the disease? Um, if they don't show any sign of disease, 
they aren't, um, they aren't serious side effects. However, there is another, another disease called lower lower, which is in the normally in forest, forested countries. And uh, once you take ivermectin, you can get a, a severe reaction. And, um, but there are also ways of managing the severe reactions. Um, but for those who have the disease and have an active immune system, first time, uh, a few days, because when you take the medicine, it lasts about two, three days. So those first two days can be really tough uh, because the medicine is killing the baby worms and your immune system is reacting to the dead baby worms. And therefore, you, you get what we call localized or um, extensive uh, body swelling. And you also itch and scratch, by the way, but you scratch for each and scratch for two days and then you are fine. But this disease, one of the symptoms is scratching. So people scratch day and night. They use stones or hot water, boil hot water and pour themselves so they can stop the scratch and it doesn't stop. You use stones, scratch and scratch. You bleed, you continue scratching. So it is worth it to scratch each and scratch for two days and then you get over it than have you know, entire, your entire life you are scratching and itching and scratching. I want to know, is the end goal the complete elimination of the black flies? Is that what you're trying to achieve? No. In some areas which were deemed feasible, we have aimed at it and eliminated the fly, especially in Uganda. But our aim is really not to eliminate the fly, especially when it's not feasible. But once we attack the fly, we reduce its population and its capacity to transmit. So if we combine that strategy with the medicine, we can actually get rid of the nematode worm, which transmits. And once the worm is gone, then the fly can thrive if it wants to thrive. <laughs> You mentioned how useful spectral imaging could be, and I wasn't sure. Were you saying that you have found a reliable source of spectral imaging in these remote areas, or are you still searching for a source? You mean in terms of technology? Right, the, the satellite with extra yeah. information in each pixel. It is damn expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, for a small area, it's thousands and thousands of dollars. And, uh, and I don't think Carter Center, I mean, will run bankrupt. So the, the study was funded by the government um, of USA. Um, and uh, my colleague, um, Professor Tom Yunash from the University of South Florida and other colleagues uh, did this study in Burkina Faso and Uganda, Northern Uganda, and we found it works. But the technology is very expensive. But suppose we study other diseases and uh, is there a way of reducing these expendit uh, expenses? Well, can we make this technology um, less, more effective, but less expensive? That would be great. When someone has the disease, I, I see there's a lot of different um, effects on them with the, the bumps and the itching and then the blindness. When they take the medicine, do those symptoms go away? Does their sight return, or are those permanent? conditions? Um, once the, you, you have, um, because it's a progression for visual Im impaired, uh, it holds visual impairment. So you don't proceed. You stop where you are. But if you are blind, you, are, you remain blind. Um, if you have a bad skin, um, or, and of course, itchiness, which really increases the, the level of um, the rough skin, all those stop and you can actually regain your skin. But if you have gone to a, a level where you have um, hanging groins, the skin is hanging, you have, it has lost its elasticity, you can't recover. You just remain, you get healed, but you remain with that issue in a, throughout your life. And once you have leopard skin, uh, you remain with leopard skin. 
um, the nodules can go away. And actually, we have found where we've been treating the nodules which appear in bony prominences, your rib cage around the groins here, and sometimes on your forehead, uh, those ones go because the worms also are dying. And therefore, um, there's n no more uh, worms being uh, retained and growing up to their adult stage. And the tragedy is that the environment where you find this disease is where you would want to build your home. <laughs> and uh, school attendance, how do you scratch day and night? You get to a point where you, you, you lose your senses. You become irrational. <laughs> That's the nature of this disease. It doesn't kill very rapidly like HIV. But as you walk, if you have this disease, you walk in San Francisco as a dead body on the street. Uh, so that's how it, it kills you and keeps you walking around. <laughs> um, so is that the, way, the best way of descri describing the disease? <laughs> um, that you don't, it doesn't kill you so that you are buried, no. And uh, you can re live up to even 60 years, 70 years, but uh, everyone will reject you. You are a destitute in your own community. Uh, you are scratching. And we say back home, if you want to scratch yourself, don't scratch yourself before your mother-in-law. This disease makes you scratch before your mother-in-law, shamelessly. So that's how bad it can be. 